We are back in business. All right, positive aspects of human factors. We had the Magnificent Seven, which I hope you all wrote down. There we are. All right, Magnificent Seven. And there were seven of them. All right, maintenance-related errors. There's a, I don't want to say a push, but there's, there's a, some chatter from certain people and groups in aviation who are becoming more and more vocal about the fact that bad things happen when you actually maintain an aircraft and we should just run them to failure. I am not of that school. <laughs> Their point being, you know, you take an aircraft that needs an annual inspection and you going to take off all the inspection panels and all this stuff, taking apart things to look and inspect and do it. Well, and then you put it back together, there's a chance that you could do something wrong when you're doing that. So it would be far better if we just left it alone and just flew it until something broke and then fix what's broken. That should ring a bell or it should, should resonate poorly with you, I think. And like, yeah, I don't want to do that. What's that? <laughs> yeah. All right. One study showed, one study showed, showed that 75% of maintenance related crashes are, 7% of maintenance related crashes. Caused by, caused by failure to follow procedures. Which is another way of saying read and follow directions. So you're going to see that that is going to be a major theme in this class. Did you read and follow directions? <coughs> I will often, you'll bring me something to correct or look at, and I will just like circle, read and follow directions and hand it back to you. You need to read and follow directions. And it's not like I'm trying to be mean, um, but you didn't read and follow directions, and that's what we're here to do. If you need me to read them to you, then you're not reading and following directions. You're requiring someone to read them for you, which is not going to get you your certificate. But I don't want to discourage you from asking questions. I love good questions. Like, I have read these directions, and here is what confuses me about these directions. That's a wonderful question. Um, I don't understand this. It's not a good question. It's like, I don't understand what? What part don't you understand? So make sure that you have read it. Come to me with your confusion. And you'll see that I carry around a, a black binder. This one's blue in lab. And I write notes in there all the time. I'm not writing about you. But every time a student comes to me and says, I don't understand these directions, there's a problem. You should be able to understand them. And so then I ask you, well, what don't you understand? We'll kind of get into it. And sometimes I'll even ask you, what would have made more sense to you? And you'll tell me like, oh, well, if you would have said this, I'll write that down. And then next class, you'll actually see that implemented in there. So I, every single class has a revision. So you'll even see on your things right at the bottom, this is revision 7 2023 in your lab sheets, right? From the very bottom, because they were revised immediately following the last class to clarify any confusion, any time there was an error made. I look at it, why was the error made? What can I do to, to correct that? So, um, but again, you have to do your part, make sure you read and follow the directions. Sometimes they're, they're very clearly. Sometimes there are certain projects that will lend themselves to you messing up easily if you're not reading and following directions. So, uh, failure to follow procedures is is I can hardly wait to find out myself. Not reading directions. misunderstanding the directions
there's a thing called confirmation bias, which I, I like that word and, and I'm always looking for it. That is when you think something should be a certain way, so you read everything to a slant that proves what you've already thought. Your mind is no longer open to what it's saying. You're trying to make what it says fit what you think it's supposed to say. And there are a lot of things that in this program, because it's the way it is in aviation, that I see students get into real big trouble. One of the, and we'll talk about this a little bit, there's a thing called an airworthiness directives, I think, the thing's called airworthiness directives. And it's like a recall for cars, but it's way more serious than that because it's airplanes. And it, what has happened is people have died. Things, bad things have happened. One or two people die, one or two airplane crashes, they issue a service bulletin from the manufacturer. The manufacturer comes out and says, whoa, we got a problem here, we got to correct this. Enough people die, the FAA gets involved and says, now it's federal law, you will do that thing. And one of the projects that we have on carburetors, and you'll never remember this, I'll tell you right now, is uh, it talks about this certain type of arm on a carburetor and it talks about whether it's got a spot face or a milled flat finish. Well, nobody offhand generally knows what a milled flat or spot face finished is. Very few students ever come up to me and go, okay, I'm reading this airworthiness directive and it talks about a spot face and a milled flat. Kevin, I don't know what those two items are. That's an awesome question, but nobody does that. What they do is they come up to me and I say, okay, you have your carburetor, are there any ADs that apply to it? How about this one? Nope, that doesn't apply. How come it doesn't apply? Well, because it says something about milled flat spot face, and I think that's this thing over here, so it doesn't apply. Like, it absolutely applied. You just misapplied a word you didn't understand to something to make it work for your, so hopefully that, that kind of makes sense what I'm saying. Don't do that. When you don't understand a word or something, stop. I had one, one guy got in big trouble because it was an error this directive, and it was uh, applicable to all serial numbered airplane this and subsequent. I'm like, well, why didn't you do it? Well, it said subsequent. That means everything before that. I'm like, no, it means everything after that. So it's like, <laughs> big deal. One little word. I'm thinking you know better. I've got about a thousand ex things running through my mind what that could be. Certainly the norms one we looked at where they changed the engine and killed all those people, they thought they knew better. Hey, we know how to do it right. Those stupid engineers telling us I got to do it this way. And eh, those guys don't know how to work on planes. Doing it right takes too much time. And my favorite, I can't see why it will matter. Actually, my favorite is where they say imagine. I can't imagine why it will matter. And then my response, my son knows this one. Well, that sounds like an imagination problem on your part because I can think of a lot of things of why it would matter. You need a better imagination because uh, it can go bad. Um, following the norm. I'm not going to write these next things because they're just kind of snotty. But I'll give you the idea. Let's see. If you don't follow procedures, the question is then, is that, is, the question is, you can't follow procedures or you won't follow procedures? Because it really comes down to that. If the procedure's there, you won't do it. You can't or you won't. If you can't, then that's a tool problem, a company problem, a, um, education problem. If you won't, that's an attitude problem. That's on you. Um, so decision making, we talked about this a couple times. Um, you have to make the decision to be a good safe mechanic. It's not something that happens by accident. So, and again, it's a decision that only you can make. I can, I've hopefully I led you there. What can happen if you don't? And now it's up to you to make that decision. And I hope you make it sooner rather than later. We already read the mechanics creed, which talks about that. And there we are with that. All right, that's all I've got about human factors. So everybody's an expert on human factors now? You guys are very quiet. 
All right, we talked a little bit about this. Now we're going to talk about officially privileges and limitations. Which is, we're going to understand the certificating process. for aircraft mechanics. And I know I already asked. Everybody in here wants to be an aircraft mechanic. Nobody's in here because they're air traffic control, right? <laughs> All right. So you want to know how to become a certificated aircraft mechanic. Well, where would you go to find this information other than me standing here telling it to you? Yep, FAR, you say FAR, FAR, you said 14 CFR, that's the same thing. Covered in Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 65. So here we go. We have the Code of Federal Regulations. This guy now has two of these books, probably. Did you buy a book? Because this one is FAR AMT which is Federal Aviation Regulations for Aviation Maintenance Technicians. If you're a pilot, you have one that says FAR AIM. Airman Information Manual. I think they changed the word airman to something now. Air person, it's, it's air something. Anyway, so this is not a complete code of federal regulations. It's the ones that ASA, the company made the book, figured these are the ones that if you're going to be a mechanic, you probably ought to know or are going to be applicable to you, we'll put them in this book. And you would be surprised at how much I have learned in my aviation history by starting in the front of some of these FAA books and reading the part that we always skip. Now, this one doesn't have anything good, but it does have a list of the federal regulations. And so part 65 is not on that page. Where's my 65? This has all of them. Certification, airmen other than flight crew members. In other words, people that are on the ground. And so we want to look at 65. Sixty-five, we got, um, we'll have the general part of it, which talks about written tests and all kinds of stuff. Air traffic control, aircraft dispatch, repairmen, parachute riggers, um, mechanics. I skipped over there, it was up at the top. So any one of those? There you are. Yes. Where did you find that? What was the first thing you said so I can kind of put to the same page in my book? What, what? And what was the first thing that you said? You said then you went to 65. How did you find that? Because I was just... Oh, the in index? Yeah, so I'm sorry. I just wanted to, like, understand how to open this book. and right. Okay. Look at it. okay. I never so, looked at it before in the class. So. Um, I don't know. That's kind of weird to me. There you go. Right here. Okay. So 65, certification. Ah, gotcha. My book happened to have all, I think that's the front has all of them in there. All right, so I'm going to look up part 65, and I'm going to look up what I need to be. So um, even though in my book it says subpart D mechanics, it's funny. We don't talk subpart D. It's not how we say things. So I want to look this up. Um, I would look up specifically, let me see, mine is very old, so, you know, hopefully I get the right reference. Uh, aircraft dispatch, subpart D, even though it is eligibility requirements, I would say it's FAR 65.71. So FAR 65.71 specifically is what I'm referring to. And if I look at 65 uh, part dot 71, I will find these things. One, you must be at least 18 years old. I got it. Check for me. Uh, be able to read, write, speak, and understand English asterisk. That's me. I put the asterisk. That's my thing. Um, there is a I didn't want to write all that out. This applies to us. Just so you know, if you don't 
read, write, speak, and understand English, you can still have an A&P certificate. It has a note on it that says valid only outside the United States. So in other words, one of our air carriers, United, Delta, whatever, if, if they're required to use U.S. certificated mechanics, but let's say they've got a, a hub in Mexico, and so everybody there speaks Mexican, so that makes speak Spanish. Spanish. <laughs> yeah, that, wait, that didn't sound right. Um, speak Spanish. <laughs> Next time I'm going to pick Germany because I speak German. So, all right, so they wouldn't, you know, that makes sense. It's like, hey, that's their language. That's how they would work most effectively. So let's get them all certificated and they don't have to speak English. You can speak the language that works for you and that works for everybody. So you can do that. Uh, have passed all tests within the last 24 months. So pass all tests, pass all tests within within 24 months. That's about two years. That's exactly two years. Let's see. Okay. Um, what that means is you graduate from the school or you do it through experience. We'll talk about that in a second. Once you start, you have to do all the tests in 24 months. It doesn't mean you have to graduate from the school and then within 24 months you have to be done. Once you graduate from the school, you could take 20 years if you wanted to and then go take your test. It's the, the graduation certificate still works. I wouldn't do that, but um, passed all tests 24 months and comply with the sections in Part D that apply to the rating. So uh, we'll stick at that. So Pat, what are the tests, by the way? Three written, which are general, general <coughs> power plant, PP, airframe. And, airframe, and then oh, three written, and one oral. technically gets one oral and one practical. We call it the oral and practical. So. You uh, you're not riding anywhere. <laughs> All right, so now you got to meet all those things. Then, as I mentioned before, we have ratings. So you have your mechanic certificate has two ratings. Two ratings. And those ratings are? Airframe. Power plant. Um, technically, we could have, somebody would say three ratings. You have airframe power plant, but that's eh, really two ratings. So, okay, so how to get the AMP? How, how to get your AMP, airframe and power plant certificate? Well, you got two paths. One, you can do it through experience. And we talked about that. You can either have 18 months for an A or P. So we're doing those like, these are the answers for the uh, module one. But for module one, are we like, we're supposed to decide where we read that and use the notes as part of that? Read the directions. Sucks when I want to say that. Huh? Sucks when I say that, huh? That's, that's, that's the whole project right there. Uh, 18 months for an A or P, or 30 months for A and P. So that's not bad. Just go work somewhere, 30 months. The problem, as I said before, is you probably won't get this wide range of experience. In 30 months, you're not going to get everything from a fabric covered little aircraft up to a multi-engine commercial aircraft. You're just not going to get all that in 30 months to the point where you're going to be able to pass a test. But um, there are schools out there that will fill in that gap. Uh, there's a, a school, I think you were there, Baker School. I've heard really good things about Baker School. I'm not paid or endorsed by them, but um, you know, I've had some people out of the military 
who have gone through most of the program the first year and really got all of the basics down. And then, so they, they came out of the military, they were eligible for their experience. They took one year of here, said, all right, I think I really have all of the basics real well. Uh, then they went to Baker School, uh, paid the money there, went to Accelerated, I don't know, it's a couple weeks or something or a week, and then took their tests. Um, or you can do the acknowledge route. Kevin, where's that? Would you call it Baker's School? Baker's, or? yeah. Tennessee or something, I don't know. Tennessee, that sounds familiar. There's this thing called Google. You could look it up on Google. <laughs> well, I figured you'd know. I don't work there. <laughs> uh, all right, knowledge. That is a part 147 school. I do not believe Baker is a part 147 school. They're just a school that opened up and said, we will, once you have your authorization to test, we will help you pass the test. You see the difference? So we're, I'm a 147 school. The FAA has come in and gave me their blessing, said if somebody passes your curriculum, you can authorize them to go take their tests. So the knowledge route, 147 school. Um, there's been a lot of changes in the 147 school, effective September 21st of 2022. Uh, at one point, you were required to have 1,900 hours minimum. And what happened is, and that's where the time cards came from, the FAA says, well, how do you know that they completed 1,900 hours minimum? And that's why we have um, our Aero 200 class, which I could explain. Um, things are a little different now, and it's, but the fact remains, when it changed, it's no, that 1900 hour minimum no longer appears in the new FAR 147. However, we have what are called OPSPECs, operating specifications for the school. And that is our agreement with our local FAA. So we have to write these operating specs and I have to write an operating manual and then there's all these other things that you don't see in here. And my agreement with the FAA, they say, okay, well, the FAR requirement for 1900 hours is out the window. It's no longer in the FARs. However, they have their order and we have our op specs. I had to write that and they say, how are you going to, what, what is your attendance policy? And they said, you're going to have time cards, right? And I'm like, yeah, we're going to have time cards still. And you're going to require them to be there X number of hours, right? And I'm like, yes, I'll write that in. So it's still there. You just don't see it when you look up the FAR. So I know if some students come and go, hey, you know, that requirement was dropped. It was dropped, but not in our op specs. So, um, so to meet your minimum required hours, and it's a little complicated, I don't want to community, but I have, not only do I work for a community college district, but I have to manage my part 147 school. The college district says, okay, you have to attend at least 6%. You can't miss let me see, more than 6% of your time. Um, miss more than that, then you can be dropped. But the FA says, uh-uh, we need to see what you're doing. And also, by the way, when I met with um, United the other day, that was one of their first questions. What is your attendance policy? I mean, right out the bat, hey, so they sat down with me, we want to party with you, got some questions for you, what's your attendance policy? And I said, oh, it's simple. Anything more than 6%, they're dropped from the program. However, we have a 100% mandatory attendance policy. So in the program, doesn't count for 309. 309, it's just kind of a hard rule. You miss four hours, you're gone. In the program, what happens is, if you miss an hour or a minute, you have to make up that hour or minute on Saturday class. That's our Aero 200. So you miss any time during the week, you come in on Saturday and they're just selected Saturdays We run Aero 200. Not, it's not every Saturday, it's just some. And it's in the morning to afternoon, it's like eight to three or something. I don't teach that one. And you just come in and you work on your projects across the street. And uh, Larry Johnson runs that one and he'll check you off if he wants to or you know feels like it. That sounds terrible. Some projects he will sign you off, some he won't. Some, it's like, eh, I'm gonna let Kevin do that. He's got a thing he does, so yeah. So that's all that Saturday is? That's all it is. So 
if you don't miss any time at all, then you don't ever have to go to Saturday. Yeah, yeah, and you don't have to go every Saturday. Let's say you miss one hour this week, and then there's Saturday class. You're like, eh, I'm busy this Saturday, but you know, three Saturdays, I'll find I'll make up my hour. Or you got a free Saturday, and you're just gonna, hey, I'm just gonna come in on my Saturday, and I'm just gonna be there for six hours, and I can, uh, I can miss some time if I want. I don't recommend it, but you can do that. And then, yeah, you know, I try and work with people. I put the stuff on YouTube, so if you miss a lecture, you can get caught up and and stuff but um, and some of you are going to go to every Saturday class simply because it's the only way you'll get your projects done you just work at a pace that's too slow and you have to come in every Saturday in order to keep up and, and pass the class but Saturday is mandatory to enroll not mandatory to go unless you miss time yeah is that Saturday class for this uh, summer course or is that for fall and on it's only for the fall spring okay. which is the actual program not to bore you but for until September 21st I remember that because my wife's birthday is September 21st until September when we changed over to the new FAR this course was not part of the program and so I could actually have as many students as I wanted the FA would show up I'm like this is not the FA it's not in our FA curriculum but during the new change everything got under the umbrella of our FA curriculum and so I have to follow all the FAR rules for all the classes Not to bore you. All right. Uh, let's see. Knowledge. Testing. I wrote this. I have how many t writtens? Three. Three writtens. And they are? And after you pass your writtens, you can? You take your oral practical. All right. Uh, let's see. That was testing. We already did. So let's put testing, which we just talked about. Otherwise, we'll be, hey, how come you're on five? What happened to that? There is a little caveat in here that does say you can invert those. You can do your oral practical first and then your testing next. Where would I find that in the FARs? I don't want you to look it up. Just give me a guess. I've talked about two FARs so far, right? Part 65, which is how you get certificated, and part 147, which is schools. 147. It tells us that we can authorize you to do it backwards if we so desire. All right, length of certificate. All right, how long does your AMP certificate last for? Lasts for life, unless surrendered or revoked. But we're not going to worry about that. So it lasts for your life. Here's the crazy thing about that. Like, I just had to renew my driver's license, and I don't know, that was like 45 bucks. I have some other licenses with the state, and they charged me a fucking bunch of money for that. Um, over my lifetime, I've, as long as I've owned my A&P certificate, I think I'm uh, under 20 bucks. I had to buy a new one because my original one was paper with my Social Security number on it. And so when they realized that that wasn't a good idea, that every time a mechanic signed their log books in somebody's log book and wrote their social security number, maybe they shouldn't do that. So then they said, okay, everybody who's got a social, um, you can uh, like send us $3 and we'll send you a new plastic card with a random generated number. And then, um, then later on they came up with some different kind of cards and I bought that one too. So anyway, so I'm probably, they're into me like, you know, nine bucks or something. So, which is crazy. Uh, last for life, um, but not active or valid unless, unless. So it does go dormant, but it doesn't, it still, it goes dormant, but you can get it back. So unless you have you have six months of work in the last 24 months. All right, so you graduate the program, take your test, boom, I got my card. 
Your card is good to go work on an airplane for 24 months. You can sit at home and watch SpongeBob for 23 months, three weeks, and six days, and it's still good. And somebody calls you up and says, hey, I need you to sign up my aircraft. I am good to go, because it hasn't been 24 months. So you can go sign up an aircraft. Still good. But after 24 months, it's not good. And so at that point, somebody said, you, you, you know, you said, well, I decide, I'm going to go get a job. Mom finally kicked me out of the basement. So I'm going to go get a job. You walk up to your employer. They say, well, you know, how long have you had your AMP certificate? Two years now. <laughs> problem is I never used it. It's uh, not a problem. You have to work for six months before you can sign stuff off. So you work with somebody for six months. At the end of six months, you're like, all right, I'm, I'm back in the saddle. I got it. You can start signing stuff off. Now, the interesting thing is, like, okay, well, that's, if you worked with that person like one hour a day, if you work with them eight hours only on every other Monday, it doesn't specify. It doesn't specify part-time, full-time. Um, it's very, it's even loose with what work is. Um, it does describe it as actual work, actual work, which, you know, that at work on airplane, supervisory, or executive, meaning you're super big. It's beyond supervisory. You're at the executive capacity. You're just writing the checks. So that to me shouldn't be valid, but okay. Yes. So what if you what if you work in general aviation, you're kind of freelance yeah. and you don't work for an employer, so you're not clocking in you're, But you're active? But you're active. Active so, is active. So how do they know that you have six months of work in the last 21 months? I mean, is it just? The, you know, that's the funny thing. It's like, they're not going to ask unless you're a problem. Oh. If you're a problem, then they're going to start digging. And they say, all right, you're working? Yeah, I'm working. Well, they're going to know you're working because you become a problem. <laughs> you're out there working, making a problem for things. They don't, I can't see the FAA ever walking up to you while you're working on an airplane. Hi, I work for the FAA and uh, you got six months experience in the last 24? You know. It's like if they did that to me, I'm sitting there where I'm working on my airplane, the hangar, they're like, hey, uh, yeah, you know, we're just kind of walking around. It, you know, you just, what you're doing right there does uh, require an A&P. Yeah, I am an A&P. Hmm? You have the proper manuals. They're right there. Or I've got, you know, they're right here because I have digitally, you know. And, um, oh, okay, okay. And you're, and they would never do this. You're active? Yeah, I'm active. I own an airplane and I work on it. See, active. <laughs> so... How long have you on the airplane? Well, I've owned the airplane for, you know, three years, five years, ten years, whatever. I maintain it. I'm active. So active really would be me just owning my airplane, working on my airplane. That's active. This is active. I'm involved in kind of an executive supervisory role. So it's really this loose kind of a thing. And it's now I would play it smart. I mean, if I said... You know, I was in a coma for six months and I can, or, or, or 24 months and I came out of it, I would say, okay, I'm not eligible to sign stuff off. I need to work under a supervisor for six months and then I'll go sign stuff back off again. So, yeah. Uh, so, pilots maintain a, a logbook. Is there anything similar for um, aircraft? We do not. It is advisable. I started one when I first started, but then it kind of was like, eh, I, I quit doing it. Yeah. So that was what I was going to say because I bought like an ASA maintenance logbook from ASA. Yeah. And I was like, oh, pretty neat. And then it was actually applicable to like real world applications. So. Yeah, it's, you know, I believe Transport Canada does that. And you have to have endorsements for certain things. We just, we just don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, my logbook, I just had a binder and I wrote stuff and it ended up becoming more of a diary and you know some of the crap that I was putting up with I'm like oh, that's just terrible so <laughs> yeah anything else on that one yeah it's funny how loose it is and it's very surprising how loose it is but again the way I see it playing out is I like the FAA and it doesn't seem to be a problem until you're a problem when you're a problem then they start looking at stuff like this you know Yeah, that's true. And so all the personnel put in place. Although pilots, we have to have a logbook. So. 
Um, okay, or, or, and I love this one, uh, some of my favorite things when I do this, or approval by the administrator. So in other words, you haven't been working for 24 months, well, you need to go out and work with somebody for six before you're activated. Or you could walk into the fit. We can't walk in the FISDO. You make an appointment with the local FA office, the FISDO, and you show up and they say, how can I help you? Yeah, I haven't been working in the industry for a couple of years, but I want to start working right now by myself on my own without supervision and signing stuff off. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, it says right in uh, FAR 65 dot uh, with 17 something else no, beyond that, that if the approval of the administrator, I can do that. And they may say, well, you are correct about that. So let me ask you some questions and they may do a, mini interview and if they feel like it they could say oh okay you're good to go <clears throat> i don't know what they do a piece of paper or something or just say oh you're good to go get out of here i don't know so all right <clears throat> but anyway that's your length of certificate questions on that everybody's good Oops, that's gonna be a b b general privileges what can you do and what can't you do this can get really confusing real fast. So I want to make it so it's not too confusing because there's different levels of things in aviation. But let's just, to keep it simple, and the simplest way to look at it is we're all A and P's or want to be, so let's look at what an A and P can do. Because there's A and P's, then below you have repairmen, then there's stuff uh, pilots can do on their own aircraft, blah, blah. But we're going to look at A and P's. And that will keep things somewhat simple, and I'll kind of weave in and out of that. But first thing we have to look at, there's different type of, uh, we'll call it work. So different, different type of, I'll put it in parentheses because I don't really like this word because it's, Maybe it'll work for me. All right. Different type of work. And this comes from FAR 43 Appendix A. Or, sorry, yeah, Appendix A is kind of where I'm pulling this out of. So, all right, there's a thing called maintenance. So, first we have maintenance. So, maintenance. And it's just exactly what it sounds like it is. Um, um, inspection, overhaul, repair, preservation, replacement of parts. Um, that's an FA term, so maintenance. Inspection is actually different from that, but they lumped it in there. So we'll put um, inspection. I'll put a little asterisk there because different. Inspection, um, overhaul, uh, repair. Preservation, and replacement of parts. Just your, your maintenance. Um, there is also something called preventative maintenance. It's a lesser of maintenance, and that is something a pilot can do. So pilots, pilots working on their own plane um, under part 91 can do this. All right, I better unpack that a little bit. So, let's see, nobody in here owns an airplane, right? You own an airplane? Yeah. What do you got? A Luscombe 8A. A what, what? A Luscombe 8A. Oh, Luscombe, I love yeah, Luscombe. Just like theirs. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, all right. So, it's your own, are you a pilot? No, my brothers are, I'm, I'm training, they're both. Training. Okay, so who owns the airplane? We own it together. So your brother, who has a pilot's license, can do preventative maintenance on your plane totally legally. And there's a section, in here 
and they're 43, FAR 43. What is FAR 43? Well, let's go to FAR 43 and tell you what FAR 43 is. It is called, not that, Preventative Maintenance, Maintenance, Rebuilding, and Alteration. Part, what? 43. What's the name of this book? 4313. AC 4313. The 43 matches the 43. That's not a coincidence. That's the way it works. 43, Maintenance. So advisory circular matches the FAR. So under part 43, Appendix A, tells me, let me see, it's got to be in here somewhere. Where's my preventative maintenance? Major alter, major repairs. Preventative maintenance. These are things that who can do? Preventative maintenance. Pilots, Pilots working on? <laughs> under part? What the hell is Part 91? Oh, God, man, it just never ends, does it? Part 91, general operating and flight rules. That means you're not an air carrier, United. You're not an air taxi. You are uh, not a, a, a school, um, a flight school working under a different part. Um, you're just yeah. the sky of me. I got my airplane, and I fly around. I'm Part 91. So... You can't see a, a pilot out there, you know, United cap getting out. Well, I'm going to change the tire because I'm a pilot and I can do it. Um, anyway, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. And it's almost shocking to me how much they can do. Removal, installation, repair of landing gear and tires, elastic shock absorbers on landing gear, servicing landing gear, shock struts, landing gear wheel bearings, cleaning and regreasing, uh, replacing defective safety wire and cotter pins. Safety wire doesn't usually go bad. Um, lubrication that doesn't require disassembly other than... Uh, you know, minor things, simple fabric patches, uh, putting in hydraulic fluid, it, it goes on. I'm not going to read everything. Uh, but anyway, so pilot can do that. But obviously we can do it because we're a &Ps. We can do it all, right? Not quite all. All right, so we can do maintenance. Uh, preventative maintenance. Uh, there we go. We got that. I'll make that part B right there. B, B. Um, C, we can have repairs. See, repairs weren't under maintenance. Although it does say repair, I don't know. We got repair, to repair is a thing. Um, so that's just what it sounds like. Something's broken, you fix it. Um, then we got D, alterations. Alterations. I'm gonna give you the technical definition of a repair, you're gonna love it. means a repair other than <coughs> a major repair. <laughs> an alteration means an alteration other than a major alteration. All right, this is a little outside the scope of this class, so I'm not going to write it, but I'll tell you what that means in a second because we'll throw in this one, a major repair <laughs> and major alteration. A few days ago, yesterday, I talked to you about a type certificate data sheet. Remember type certificate, TCDS. And that is the, what the airplane is. So you can look that up for any given airplane. I'll look it up for like a little Cessna 140. And um, I like that one because they're old. The older ones had more information. But anyway, it would have, you know, what kind of engine it has, what kind of propeller it has, what kind of this, what kind of that. And it's the way the airplane rolled off the factory. and available options so if I want to change one of the options that were available on my airplane from the factory that is an alteration I am changing something for example um, let's say that I want to change the air cleaner let's say Cessna said we can have one of two air cleaners you can have either uh, you know a paper type that's like this type or another that's like foam or something like K&N filter well you can have either one and I've got a paper one and I say well 
I want the foam one, like the K&N. You guys from K&N for cars? It's the foam foam up there. So I want the foam one. Well, if it was an option on the type certificate data sheet, then I swapped those. I've altered the airplane. I've changed it. But it's a just an alteration because it was an option. Now, in my example, that never happened. Cessna rolled off the line with paper element filters on the on for the uh, engine air filter. That's all they ever had. But another company came out, they called Bracket. They said, hey, we're going to make these foam air filters. It's the air filter that goes into the engine. So it filters the in that, like your air filter in the car. We're going to make these foam ones. I want to buy one. But Cesta never made them. So changing it out now becomes a major alteration because it wasn't approved from the factory. So something is, you don't let the word major fool you about because changing an air clear on my airplane is literally two screws. And that's a major alteration. Why? Because it didn't come on the original aircraft and it requires more paperwork. What kind of paperwork? Well, just so you know, I mean, it's like I said, outside of the scope. I have to get a supplement to the type certificate, which does come with the product, and I have to fill out a form 337, which is called a major alteration repair form. I have to fill it out in duplicate. I have to keep one with the aircraft and send one off to Oklahoma City for the aircraft records and then make a logbook entry stating that I completed this. And by the way, they have to do weight and balance instructions for continued airworthiness and all kinds of other stuff. So that becomes a major alteration, even though it's just a very simple little thing to do. Um, major repairs. Or repairs same thing so um, there are some repairs that are very simple and some that are called a major repair how do I know the difference well thankfully FAR 43 appendix a has a list and if what I'm doing is on the list then it is a major repair and by the way if it's a major repair that requires a form 337 major alteration repair which you must complete you must in duplicate save one of the aircraft records one goes to oklahoma city and in logbook entry so major repair has all that so in a, in a nutshell I mean, major repair um, means uh if improperly done might appreciably affect weight balance structural strength performance power plant operation flight characteristics or other qualities affecting airworthiness I think a better definition, that is true, and it does there, is simply to say there's a list in Appendix A that's, that's not on here. So what are some major repairs? Um, repairs to the following parts of an airframe or repairs to the following types involving strengthening, reinforcing, splicing, manufacturing of primary structure members or the replacement. Where replacement is by fabrication such as riveting, welding, or airframe major repairs. And, so you repair anything to a box beam, uh, monocoque, semi-monocoque wings, control surfaces, spars, spar flanges, truss beams, wings, tails, engine mounts, fuselages, longerons. There's just a whole list. If you fix anything on this list, it's a major repair. Major repair. And I already told you what a major alteration is. It's anything basically that's not on the type certificate data sheet. Let's see. What do we got here? Um, major alterations. Major alterations of the following parts and alterations of types when not listed in the aircraft specifications, type certificate data sheet, issued by the FAA are airframe alterations. And it just says wings, tail, fuselage. It just describes the airplane, basically, is what it does. So, all right, we got that? So, major alteration. There's a list in FAR 43. Appendix A has a list. Are you with me? Okay. Then we have ABCFG, we have inspections. They're their own thing. And the reason why I really want to say they're their own thing is because number one, if I want to, when, when I complete maintenance or I complete an inspection, because I think maintenance is one thing, inspection is something else. And I, and I consider them two separate things like that because when I complete one or the other, I have to make a logbook entry. 
and what would I have to write in my logbook when I do such things as complete a major alter and a repair or maintenance or inspection? You got to write stuff. How do I know what to write? A good book done tells you what to write. So there's one section in here that tells you what to write if you are doing maintenance and another one that tells you what to write if you're doing inspection. They add some stuff. So it tells you exactly what to do. What section would I look that up under if I want to know what to write in a logbook entry? What do you think? We've talked about part 147. You think it'd be there? No, because part 147 is what? Schools. Part 65? Part 65 is? Certification of airmen. Would it would it be under my how to get a certificate? No, nope, that was a good try though. Part 43 is maintenance. 43.9, 43.11. You got it. So dot nine would be uh, maintenance. Dot eleven would be inspections. Let me see if I'm right on that. Uh, yep, I was right. 43.9. Tells me the things I say. There's five things. I count it different than they do. Um, description of the work, date of completion, name of the person performing the work. Um, let me see. And there's signature. Um, yeah, and signature and number. and number. That's it. I was because they say it's one thing. I say certificate and number. So all right. So inspections. Inspections are different because they you have to write what kind of inspection you did. So there's another one there. So inspections, um, what to write. Again, don't have to worry about that. But there's all different kind of inspections. We have like a 25 hour inspection, H -O -E hour. There's a 50 hour. There's 100 hours. Obviously, there'd be a 75 in there too. Um, and there's annual inspections. We'll just look at those. Annual inspection, just to name a few, but the most popular. All right. So we have just, we can lump them in say by hour or by calendar. Again, a little outside the scope of this class, but so you understand something. <clears throat> Things get even more complicated. The deeper you go, the more complicated it gets. So for example, I fly part 91, not for hire, not at a flight school. So legally, I do not have to do service bulletins that the manufacturer issues, even if it's as mandatory, I don't have to um, because that's just the way it's set up. Um, I do not have to do 25, 50 or 100 hours, 75 hour inspections on my airplane. Even if the, the maintenance manual is, you know, has them in there, I don't have to do them. I do because it's not in here. It tells me, it doesn't say that I have to. It does say that I have to do an annual inspection. So every year it has to come down and have to do an annual inspection. And I have to do all the things that it tells me to do in FAR 43 Appendix D. Scope and detail of items as applicable to the particular aircraft to be included in annual and 100 hour inspections. Now, wait a minute. Annual and 100 hour. Was that the same thing or is it two different things? This is where it gets really confusing. An annual inspection and a 100-hour inspection both have the exact same checklist. What does a 100-hour do? Every 100 hours. Do I have to do it on my airplane? No. Nope, because I don't fly for hire or I'm not flight school. So I can just disregard that. But I have to do it every year. I got to do an annual. Now, let's just say my airplane was for hire. So now I have to do 100 hours. So how often do I have to do 100 hours? Every 100 hours. And how often do I have to do an annual? Every year. Every year. And it's two different things. Even though it's the same thing, it's two different things. Now, you could lump it in. If it just so happened that the 100 hour came, I could do, do the same inspection and say I did a 100 hour and an annual. It's the same thing. 
See how confusing it is? Is the 100 hour inspection the same as an annual inspection? It's the exact same thing. It's the exact, exact same procedure. Exact know? same procedure. It's, it's, there's not, everything on here, it's just one list, 100 hours slash annual, right? right? So, um, okay, to make it a little more complicated, an A and P can do a 100 hour, but an A and P can't do an annual, you have to be an IA. So we'll get to that. So it's like, who does what? It's gonna be crazy. So, but anyway, so let's just circle back around there. The only people that have to do the 25, 50, 75, 100 hour inspections are, are basically your four higher. They have to do them. If you're just part 91, flying around, going out to breakfast, then you only have to do the annual inspections. Now, can you do 25, 50, 100? I do. And I change my oil every 50 hours, new inspection on the engine and lubricate the controls. And, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're simple. It's not much to them. But, yeah. Is this referring to flight time? Yes, flight. Uh, yes, flight time. And it is distinction. It's not ground, ground time doesn't count. You could run it 100 hours on the ground. That's zero. So that's a whole other thing. Uh, yeah, I do my oil based on run time. Because... I like my airplane. All right, so we have inspections. So who can do what? Who can do what? All right. Let's see if we can make this more simple than what I've got here. As an AMP, as an AMP, you can. Let's do it that way. You can't, or we should say you may perform, supervise, sign off. Okay. Perform, supervise, sign off. This is it. A whole ball of wax. You can do it. You can stand there, watch somebody do it. You can return it to service. All right. So we got preventative maintenance. We've got maintenance. We have repairs. We have alterations. And we have our, we'll say hourly inspections. Twenty-five, fifty, seventy-five, hundred, five hundred, this is two hundred hour. Whole ball of wax. You don't need anybody. Um, as an AMP, AMP, you may perform, supervise but not sign off, but not sign off. You cannot return to service. Major alterations, major repairs. Two things. with me on that you can do it you can't sign it off why can't you sign it off it's going to require an FAA form FORM 337 and that's kind of your key right there it needs a form 337 you're not doing it you can't fill out form you can't uh, use form 337. Form 337 is a major alter major alteration repair forms. Okay, um, let's see. Just major alterations or also major repairs? Major alterations, major repairs. Well, see, right, right there. Yeah, yeah. So an AMP can can never sign off anything that requires a form 337? Correct. Assuming you don't have an IA, okay? Now, let's talk about an IA. Yeah, let's do that. 
Yeah, whatever. Um, what is an IA? IA is an inspection authorization. I want to know about inspection authorization. What part of FARs would I look that information up? Uh, there you got. You cheating over there? Part 65, which is certification. So under 65.91. What is an inspection authorization? Well, inspection authorization is an add-on to your A and P. So put that as an add-on, add-on to A and P. It's the next level. It's the highest level. Um, you have to have your A and P certificate for two years and been actively involved. Let me make sure that's three years. Three years. To 65.9. Well, that's everything in there, right? 65.9. Uh, hold, hold a currently effective mechanic certificate, both airframe rating and power plant rating, uh, each of which is current and effective for at least three years, engaged for the last two years, have a fixed base of operation, have available to him the equipment, facilities, and inspection data necessary to properly inspect airframes, power plant, propellers, related components, pass a written exam. And you can have an IA. An IA is only good for one year. You have to renew it every single year, sort of. It used to be every year you had to renew it. Now you renew it every other year, but you have to have qualify every year. It's complicated and it always makes you cranky. But um, anyway, so have an IA. So let's now look at um, what can an IA do. So. And A and P with an IA can do obviously anything an A and P can do because you have an A and P, right? Uh, you do. Can. So return to service. Major alteration repair. So you can return to service major alteration repair because a little bit ago, you couldn't do it, right? I said an A&P cannot return to service major alteration repair. Now you get your IA, now you can. Can the IA perform the major alteration repair? Yes, because yes, it's an A&P. All right, and perform an annual inspection. You know, and I really should come back up here and do something. Let me see. Um, let me perform, supervise. Um, hourly inspections, really it's perform. You're never ever supposed to supervise an inspection. You do the inspection. You don't supervise an inspection. So I make that distinction to say, an IA can't work with an A&P and say, well, you're an A&P and I want you to go do an annual. Don't worry, I'm standing here watching. You can't. My eyes, I have to be my eyes on it. Now, out in the field, it's really common for an IA to work with an A&P or even a non-A&P or a pilot owner. Say, okay, you guys probably do that. If your brothers don't have an A&P or an IA. Mm -hmm. So you may, do you know who does your annual inspections? Mary. Johnson? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so then that's exactly my point. So you guys take the airplane, you open up all the panels, take the seats out, get it all prepared. An IA shows up with a flashlight, does all the inspection work. Looks at all the airworthiness directives, log books, everything needs to be done. Eyes on the airplane. Says, all right, I'm done looking. You go ahead and put it back together. Then usually you guys put it back together and the IA may come back if they choose to and make sure all the panels are on well and then they sign it off. But they do the inspection. All right, perform an annual inspection. So we got that. Well, that wasn't so bad, was it? Then A and P and or A P with an IA can never, never. What can't you do? 
Um, let me see. Major alterations. Major repairs. Two propellers. Got an AP, got an IA. You cannot do major alterations, repairs, repellers. End of story. You can't do it. That is only a part 145 prop repair station. And I'll talk about repair stations in a minute. Um, you can never um, perform any repairs to instruments. Aircraft instruments, as an AP, you can take them out, you can put them in. That's it, you're done. Can never um, well, this is obvious, but perform perform, supervise a task for which you do not have experience, training, equipment, or manuals. Name a few things. Does that include uh, calibration of any instruments? That is correct. So. That's a any. You can take them out, you can put them in. That is the end. Which instrument are you talking? All covered. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. I was just I was just curious. Yep. I, I yeah, ours needs to be calibrated, so I was wondering I, I wanted to find out. Um I believe if you take it to Airborne Electronics on Executive Airport, that because when you when you dial in the Colesman window, it's like off what it should be. Yeah, there's a little screw behind there, then they're easily adjusted. Uh huh. So I've never done it, but I. Airborne electronics, you said. Yeah, I think you can take it in there, and they'll do the little. They'll do it. It's Randy over there. He's just fantastic. Yeah. Like, you know, I have my VSI read like plus seventy five. Yeah. Probably. That you can do, because they give you a screw right there. Yeah. And I think you're expected to. Okay. Also the EGT, you can do the EGT, so exhaust gas temperature. But that's yeah. That's just, I don't know. I would. <laughs> and you can obviously adjust the compass. Yeah. So we can adjust compasses. That's part of what we do. That too, actually. Yeah, we, we swing compasses. That's us. That's, that's who does that. But we're not allowed to take them apart and reseal them, even though you can buy all the parts on aircraft spruce to do it. Even the compass glue and everything like that? You're talking about that? Yeah, you're not supposed to. Oh, really? Yeah. If you have experimental, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they sell all the stuff for it. Right, okay, I get it. But that's right, right. Yeah. Oh, I think I went past a break time, didn't I? Manuals. All right, let's take a break there real quick. Or, you know. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, it says only a part 145 proper repair. Station. Station.